Well, we're in our fifth week in this series of Follow Me, and uh, we've had all these experiences, these encounters of people that some Jesus invited to follow, some of them they wanted to follow and they couldn't quite do it. And in each one of these, there's an invitation and there's a challenge. And the invitation by Jesus is, you know, come follow me. And it's like, you know, we hear that in our lives, come follow me. But along with the invitation, there's this challenge side of it. And that is, if you're going to follow, then there has to be some change, you see. If you want to become like me, then you're going to have to imitate my life. You're going to have to pursue me. And so there, this is a, always kind of a balancing between these two things. But the challenge um, is that you can't follow and remain the same. Now, uh, today we come to Matthew 19, 16 to 22. You've heard this before, I'm sure. And I begin reading at the 16th verse. Behold, a man came up to him saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? Jesus said, You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, All these I've kept. What do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, If you would be perfect, go, sell what you possess, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Well, this is the last encounter that we're going to have this Lent with, with some would-be follower. Next week is, is Palm Sunday, and there's, there's following him in praise. But, but this week, we actually have a, a young man that seeks out Jesus. And the young man seeks Jesus, and he has desire, and he also has a problem. And his desire is for eternal life, for life that does not end. And the young man is a seeker, and he's devout. And he keeps the commandments, and he's a, he's a believer, and he has desires to live this godly life, and he's taken all these commandments seriously, you see. It's not just an outside thing, but it's serious. In fact, this young man, I think, is quite the model for, you know, life in the world. This, this is a good guy, this rich young man. He's young. He's successful, he's devout, he's a good man. This is the kind of young man you'd say, now when you grow up, I want, to, I want you to be like him. You know, you get him to come speak to your sixth grade class. That's who this guy is. Be like him. Work hard, seek God, do good. But he seeks Jesus because uh, he hopes that perhaps Jesus has a solution for his problem. His problem is that he's done everything that he's been told to do. He's done all the commandments and all the religious authorities have told him these things, and he's done these, but they have not given him life. See? They were promised to him that these would give life. He's followed the rules, all the guidelines, all the advice, and it's not worked. And he knows that he's not entered into life, and he knows that he's just done a bunch of stuff, but having done all the bunch of stuff, he still doesn't have life that doesn't end. You know, we're not just talking about after you die, but life right now, you know. And it's a huge problem because if he's done everything that he was supposed to do to give him life and it hasn't happened, it hasn't worked, then there is a very real possibility that there's no such thing as eternal life. See, I feel sorry for this guy. I think, don't you feel kind of sorry for him? I mean, he's... He's tried hard. He says, I've done the right things. I, 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 I'm managing as well as anyone could manage. So, so why do I feel today then that, that life just is kind of empty and kind of pointless and kind of insignificant? Why don't I feel like I know God? You know, how, how do I get that eternal quality to life, that inner peace, that grace, that goodness, that that peace that I see in you, Jesus. Why, why don't I have what you've got, Jesus? You see, 
How can I be like you? What have I missed? What do I lack? Just tell me and I'll do it. Just that one more thing, you know. I think you have to feel for him. I, I, I like this guy. I, I, I admire, I trust this guy. You know? And he, he's following hard after God. He wants, I want this guy in my church. Not, not, nothing bad about you guys, but I want this guy in my church too, right? He'd be a good church member, wouldn't he? He's always going to do the right thing. You know, this is the kind of guy that you go after. He isn't playing any games, doesn't care what others think or say. He goes right up to Jesus because he sees something in Jesus that nobody else has got. Maybe he's got the missing piece, you see. Jesus says, well, you just lack one thing. That's, that's how it's reported in Luke. Same passage in Luke. Jesus adds in, you just lack one thing. If you want to be complete, and that's what the word perfect here, uh, we, sometimes we hear the word perfect in a translation, we think it means you know, spotless and without sin. Perfect here means complete. Um, then sell everything and give your money to the poor and come follow me. Now, a lot of times, most of the time, actually, you will hear this, uh, this passage and the words of Jesus that follow and we'll get to those in just a little bit, as part of a teaching about money. That's where, that's where we go here. In fact, the popular spin on this is to kind of, you know, vilify rich people. Because, you know, rich people just taking their money from poor people. And so uh, they could be good if they would give their money back to the poor people, and then the rich people would be like them and, you know, that's, that's the popular spin on this. But that, this isn't about money, really. Later, Paul would uh, warn in uh, 1 Timothy 6.10, a verse that's one of the most often misquoted verses. Um, and Paul says, the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. And usually that's quoted as money is the, is the root of all evil. But it, that's not what he says. He says, the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. But money has no inherent moral character to it having more of it won't make you make you bad or good or having less won't make you good or bad it's not good or evil the love of money will cause a lot of bad things to happen and it's kind of dangerous money is but that's not really what this is about Jesus does follow this passage with a teaching about money and the kingdom of God and he says hey it's really difficult for a rich person to enter, for a wealthy person to enter into the kingdom of God. Because money is without a doubt the most popular substitute for God that there is. When, when we have a lot of money, we think, I, I'm, doing, I'm doing well, I'm fine. I, I, can, I can manage everything on my own. I don't need anybody else to tell me what to do. We think money can take care of us. We're fooled into thinking that since we're not dependent on other people, that I'm doing a good job by myself. And it's really a substitute for God. It's an illusion. Sam Polk uh, was a young man on Wall Street that by age 30, had made more than $5 million in bonuses. I mean, you hear some of these stories about these guys on Wall Street. It's like, wow. You know, it's just unbelievable amounts of money that a young man can get into. Uh, he started when he was just age 25, and uh, he's living, living in Manhattan. He, he said it, it was an easy thing to go to a World Series if I wanted to. It was no big deal. I could afford the tickets. I had a tremendous feeling of importance and power, especially for a 25-year-old kid. He says, but age 30, he, he, he quit his job on Wall Street, and despite the money he'd been making, he was still consumed by envy. He went to work at a hedge fund, and his obsession with money just got worse. In a New York Times op-ed, he said, now, working elbow to elbow with billionaires, I was a giant fireball of greed. I could buy anything I wanted. He says, our, you know... My, my friends were the mayor of New York. Senators came into my office. He says, this is royalty. And Polk describes getting angry over a $3.6 million bonus because it wasn't big enough. The $3.6 million was not enough for him. And he realized that what he had was a wealth addiction. So he explains, he said, I came to realize, and this is an important part, that I had been using money as this thing the world uh, I was using money as this thing that would quell all my fears. So I had this belief that maybe someday I would get enough money 
that I would no longer be afraid and I would feel successful. And one of the things I learned on Wall Street was no matter how much money I made, the money was never going to do it. You know, the more you get, the more you think you need because it doesn't do what you think it's supposed to do, which in his case was get rid of his fear. So Jesus says it's dangerous and it's a test of the best of character, but it's not evil. Nor will giving money to the poor make you good. Money can lure us into away from reality when we believe that lie that it's enough and money can fill my needs. But I think the reason that Jesus tells him to leave the power of his money is, is not that money is evil, but that money was taking the place of God. For this rich young ruler, every invitation, every challenge that Jesus gives to someone to follow him is about the absolute nature of the call. His call is absolute. Uh, so he tells the fishermen to leave their nets. The scribe comes to him and he's not ready to, be, to answer an absolute call. Uh, Matthew, he absolutely has to leave his old life. And you know, Matthew left his own. Jesus called his disciples to follow him alone, not him among others. And it's an absolute call, this call to follow. And, and I would propose that um, many, many people almost follow, you know, but have, have the demand of absolute kind of, it kind of sticks in our throats. It, it's hard to swallow this idea that following Jesus must be everything, absolute. And I mean, so often we get to the almost part. You know, I almost did that. Remember the, the ad campaign, Harley Davidson did it um, years ago, and a grandfather is telling his grandson about the time that he almost bought a Harley. And he describes the Harley and, you know, the motorcycle and, and the grandson's just in awe of his grandfather, that his grandfather had a Harley. Well, you know, no, I almost bought it, he says. He says, well, what happened? Well, I bought vinyl siding for the house instead, you know. And you can tell the grandson's opinion. Of, well, my, he could tell his friends, my grand, grandpa almost bought a Harley. He was almost cool, you know. Ad, camp, ad Council is always doing, uh, since 1940s, been doing um, public service announcements. And the thousands of commercials they have produced, um, they, they did one. I want to show you just two of them. They're just 30 seconds long on Don't Almost Give. This is a man who almost learned to walk at a rehab center that almost got built by people who almost gave money. Almost gave. How good is almost giving? About as good as almost walking. This is Sarah Watkins. A lot of people almost helped her. One almost cooked for her. Another almost drove her to the doctor. Still another almost stopped by to say hello. They almost helped. They almost gave of themselves. But almost giving is the same as not giving at all. Hard hitting, aren't they? You feel kind of guilty just watching that. I mean, that's what they're trying to do. It's all the almost stuff that we do, you know. But it's true. I mean, we, we, we think about doing a lot of things, but we almost do it. We don't quite get around to it, you know. And just think of how much we almost do. But then this, this other competing force stops it. Maybe, you know, i just kind of shy, or, or, or maybe I just don't have the time, I think. You know, we, we almost invite the new neighbors over for dinner, but what would we say? What would we talk about if we invited them over? I don't really know them. What would we say? I mean, we almost give our evenings to, to tutor some kids at the school, but gosh, you know, I don't know. You know, I'm, I'm not sure what's going to come up. We almost do it. We almost do something we think we would love to do 
and we know it's the right thing to do, but then something always blocks it. Something always gets in the way. It just, it just isn't the right time. And I mean, we got so much going on right now, but I, but I almost did it. You know, we, we can make one of those commercials for ourselves. I almost got a Harley, you know, I, I almost gave my life to Jesus. <laughs> can you imagine telling your grandkid? Yeah. When I was about 19 or 20, the Lord was really working in my life and I almost gave my life to Jesus, you know? And he says, well, what did you do, grandpa? Oh, the cats had a good season, you know, so I decided not to do that because it just take too much time. Boy, I'm really meddling there, and I, I shouldn't pick on the cats. But, but you know what I mean? There's always something else that comes in, some kind of force. And the rich young man, he got to almost. He almost was a disciple, a follower. We never get his name. Maybe he would have written a gospel. Maybe he would have served as an apostle to a, a nation or two. Uh, maybe, maybe he would have had kids named after him or a cathedral or something, you know? Think of what he could have become. But, but he never got past the almost. He's the almost disciple. And he walks off sad because he knows he's so close, but he remains an almost. Now, now think about that. Process that for a minute. Uh, the heritage of being an almost. She almost was a good friend, but she didn't show up, you know. He almost was a good dad, but gosh, he loved work, just loved his work. She almost was a good teacher, but she didn't quite work hard enough at it. He almost was a good husband, but he just couldn't let go of the past. I mean, she almost was a strong leader at church, but man, she loved her movies. Almost, almost sounds acceptable though when you compare it to the absolute that's what i want us to see these two things alongside each other jesus uses the absolute he says you must love me with all your heart all your soul all your strength all your mind and we think how about most or some or as much as others isn't that enough he says no all it's the absolute and all seems let's let's face it it seems unreasonable Jesus says, you have to love me with all that you... That just doesn't seem reasonable. The reality is that we've each had one thing which is in competition in our lives. We may have 20 or so, but there's, we've at least got one thing. Everybody's got one thing that's in competition in our lives. There, there are some which are obvious, especially for other people to see. And these competing gods exert their power and their influence. If you have an addictive personality then you know the strain. I mean, always there's competition for your time and your heart. You know, we learn that we, we can't entertain these other gods if we have an addictive personality, that we have to turn our back on them. We, we can't play games with them. We have to get serious about them and kick them out of our lives. But even more difficult to identify and fight is the competition for interests and gods that seem good. These are really hard. I mean... See, when the one thing is maybe uh, our family, our, our vocation, our, some work that we do where we receive and others receive benefit, it's most difficult to see it. You don't know how many pastors I've talked to through the years that talk about how they totally neglected their relationship with Jesus Christ for the church. The church becomes their thing. Because so many people they think need them and can't live without them. And the church is, becomes their one thing that they're not willing to give up for Jesus. So what would Jesus say to us? What would he identify as your one thing? The one thing that competes for his place in, in your life? Some he might say, hey, sell your stuff, give the money to the poor and come follow me. And for some of us, we'd say, that's no big deal at all. I don't care about my stuff. <laughs> don't bother, you know, my stuff's fine. And for others, it's like, wow, no, never. To others, he might say, put your reputation, put, your, uh, put public opinion above me. We say, oh, wow, I don't, that's just too much. Others, he might say, um, you know, you run to your drug for comfort instead of running to me. To others, he might say, you only love me to the degree that I help your family. 
I'm kind of the God of your family. And, you know, mess, straighten your messes out. Like the rich young ruler, we're, we're incomplete until the one thing is replaced by the person of Jesus Christ. And so the young man is sad because he's very rich and he goes away. And notice here that Jesus lets him leave. Jesus doesn't chase after him. He doesn't run after him, compromise. This is an absolute. There's no compromise here. Jesus just lets him leave because of the one thing. And I guess we're not <clears throat> certain as to how this encounter turns out. It doesn't tell us. Did the young man go away and sell everything that he had and then come follow Jesus? Is that what he did? You know, uh, there have been all kinds of speculations and some traditions and stuff, but we really don't know. All we know that the thing was so powerful and strong that he was divided about which way to go. The fact that his name's not recorded here probably means that he didn't do what Jesus asked him to do, or his name would probably be in this story, as the church would want to remember this man. But right after this encounter with the rich young man, the disciples became upset. So I want to read the rest of this. Matthew 19, 23 to 26. And Jesus says to his disciples, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, With, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. So I want us to take that ending today after you know a very difficult discourse here. I want us to take that ending today that all things are possible with God. Because you see, this, this call to, to follow this absolute call upon our lives seems so impossible to us. It does to me. Jesus, you want the one thing that I hold? You want that too? That just seems impossible. Like the young man, we may have, have tried to do the right thing our entire lives. Okay, it's still not found life that doesn't end. The thought of choosing between our one thing and Jesus, well, it's probably not something that we're ready to do, nor is it even something that we think that we can do. So here again from Jesus, he says, you can't do it, you see. You can't do it on your own. This isn't something you can do. You cannot save yourself. He says, but all things are possible with God. Again, the absolute, all things, all things are possible. I think that his, his sadness about his wealth, the sadness of the rich young man, his sadness is probably the start at least he cared enough to be sad, okay? When God reveals to us what, it, what, what takes his place in our lives, be it one thing or many things, if we're sad about it, that's a start, okay? That's at least recognizing that, that I want more, that I need more life in me and in my life, okay? And so at least that's a start, and it's, it's, it's quite a shock, it's quite unsettling, and to say immediately, oh, well, yes, I'll, I'll just give that up today and I'll come follow you and, and that's that. That's, that's not really real, is it? For us just to decide that. Becoming aware of my one thing, I think, is, is quite a bit. So that's what I would like to, um, and I hope that God is doing this today, is to challenge us to do, is to be aware of the things that we put before the Lordship of Jesus Christ. What are these things in our lives? I'm not asking you to give them up today. I think that's a bit much. Perhaps it might just make us kind of irritated. Uh, perhaps it might make us a little sad. Um, perhaps we just would like for the whole thing to be over and just go on with something else. But I want you to hold these two things in tension, if you would, please. The one thing that I feel I just don't want to let go or I can't let go over here and then over here, the promise 
that all things are possible with God. These two things are intention. Who's going to win? The all things are possible with God? Or my belief that I can't let this go, that this is too much? You see what I mean? That's what I want us to take home today. Let's, let's pray through that a little bit.